installment. I'm Pat Murray. Now, what I probably need to do is to explain the crazy name TV Skywriter. That's because I actually publish a community paper called the Durham Skywriter here in Durham, North Carolina. And I also have a radio show called Radio Skywriter on WNCU here in the Triangle area. So now I'm starting a TV hangout, so to speak, Google Plus hangout called TV Skywriter. So welcome. Now we're going to be talking to a gentleman. Here's his book. His name is Abraham Bolden. Let me read the cover here. It says, The Echo from Dealey Plaza. That's the name of the book. Okay. The true story of the first African American on the White House Secret Service detail and his quest for justice after the assassination of JFK. Wow. Mr. Bolden, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me, Patricia. We had a little problem, but we're here. Well, you know, this, this technology, I mean, you know, I'll get the hang of it eventually. <laughs> you know, it, it, now, it's very, yes, go right ahead. I'm going to ask you about this book, but first, I want to ask, who was Abraham Bolden before he became a Secret Service agent? Well, I grew up in a small town in East St. Louis, Illinois. I was very interested in music. I grew up in a poor family. Uh, my dad held two eight-hour jobs and sent all of his children to college. I graduated from uh, from uh, Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. Uh, I uh, became a very uh, good classical trumpet player, and uh, along the way, I uh, joined several dance bands. I met Miles Davis, who was in the band with my brother. And now, wow. yes, I, I was quite a musician, and I had intended to make a career out of, out of music. But there was always that uh, law enforcement side of me also that was crying out to be uh, uh, delivered. So I was in sort of a dilemma rather to be a policeman or rather, <clears throat> or rather to be uh, a, a, a musician. Well, when I went off to school, I had a terrible accident. Uh, we were playing a gig one night, and uh, unfortunately, I imbibed too much alcohol. I fell, broke my front tooth, Ooh. and uh, that was the end of the trumpet playing in those days, back in those days. However, I wasn't uh, too disappointed but, uh, because, like I said, I had always been interested in law and uh, always uh, able to study. I want to find out what was the problem in, in our society. And most of the friends, most of my uh, mentors when I was growing up were policemen. And uh, so after I graduated from college, I had an opportunity to either go teach school, high school in a small town in southeast Missouri, or take a job as being the first African-American Pinkerton detective in St. Louis, Missouri. And so I took the latter job, and that uh, sent me on my way into becoming a policeman. Wow. How long did it take for you to get married? I, you know, a black man with a job doesn't last long on his own. You know, you know the very important thing about that, and the significant thing was the marriage in my life, which my wife just passed away in 2005. I'm sorry. I had known her all my life. She lived down the block from me. We used to play house, and she used to make mud pies. I would bring my little dad's old lunch bucket, and, and we would play mom and dad, you know, and all this. I, never knowing that I was going to grow up and marry this girl. And uh, so cute. Isn't that something? Now, she lived yeah. about four doors down from me. And uh, for some reason, I used to like to pull her hair. She wore her hair in plaits back there in those days. I'd run up behind, and I would full of her and she told my mother on me one day we came home from grade school together and my mother called me she said Abraham why do you keep bothering Barbara I said because I don't like her she's got skinny legs and she said no she says just the opposite said, hey you like her and she's not paying mm -hmm. you any attention my mother looked mm -hmm. me in the eye and, uh, at that very day and she said you going to marry Barbara and I tell you, I went away to college, and, and, and I had my gamut of a few girlfriends and this, but I came home uh, one Easter, and I happened to see that this girl was walking to church. She was dressed in white. She had on a long white, what they call in those days, a hula hoop dress. 
And I'm telling you, she was making that hula hoop hoop. And, she um, made it work, and, huh? Yeah, yeah, oh, she was working it out. And I looked off to my left hand side and I said, looks like I know that girl. And I hadn't seen her for a couple of years, even though she was a friend of the family. I had gone off to college. and uh, But she was still a friend of the family. And so I went around the block and I looked, I said, geez, that looks like Barbara. But see, it's a difference between a 15-year-old girl, a 17-year-old girl, and a 19-year-old girl. And she was about 19 years old at the time. So I went around the corner for a second time and I hollered out, Barbara. And she answered. And had her had her legs improved by that time? <laughs> had they ever? <laughs> and uh, she gave me three of the most wonderful children that a, that a person could ever have. As a matter of fact, she that. was uh, the one who engineered me going into the state police. Uh, mm -hmm. She 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 kept my motivation up uh, to uh, to keep advancing in police work. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the way I went into Pinkerton National Detective Agency, she was reading a paper uh, one Sunday morning, a Sunday morning newspaper, and she says, they have a police job open over at Pinkerton National Detective Agency, so why don't you go over and apply? You've been sitting around saying you want to be a policeman and you're not going to take the teaching job. I said, but Pinkerton doesn't hire uh, black agents. She says, you never know. She says, take this newspaper clipping that I have and go over there and find out. Well, I said, I you know growing up in, in East St. Louis, and say it was very prejudiced at that time. We still had colored and white washrooms down there at that time. So wow. and we're talking about back in the 50s, 1955, 56. Now, wow. you know, uh, Emmett Till was lynched down in Mississippi, I think, in 54, somewhere along yeah. in there. So we're dealing with those times, and St. Louis was one of the biggest slave markets uh, that was in the West, the, the Northwest. And now, so it was one of the capital slave markets. So we had to contend with a lot of racial segregation when I was growing up in East St. Louis. Sure. But she saw this application, so I put the paper up in my lapel. And uh, and uh, I went over to uh, Pinkerton National Detective Agency, and when I walked in, the young lady was sitting there typing. And mm -hmm. of course, she was European. They didn't have uh, too many uh, assistant secretaries back in those days. She says, yes, in that type of word, I say, would say, yes. What do you <laughs> want here? <laughs> you, you, you know. And I say, I came to apply for the job as a detective with the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. She says, we're not hiring anybody. And say, oh, yes, you are. And so my wife had armed me with the paper. I, I hand the, 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 uh, the uh, secretary the clipping. And she said, no, we're not hiring people like you. Well, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to contest. Yeah, yeah, excuse me. I was ready to pack up and my little briefcase and turn. I turned towards the door. Because I know it could have go further than that. All she had to do probably was call somebody and they throw me down 13 floors. <laughs> but, but that's the way I was thinking. <laughs> but anyway, it didn't happen like that. As it happened, they had a, a general manager, his name was Mr. Mertz. And his office was right behind the secretarial desk. And he heard what was going on out there. So he said, just a minute. He says, uh, uh, what's going on out there? He said, he came in and he's looking for a job, but we're not hiring anybody. He says, yes, we are. Mm -hmm. he, and it turns out he was from Minnesota, and, but he had been transferred. And Minnesota was altogether different from St. Louis, the mm -hmm. racial mm -hmm. attitudes and everything, you know. Yeah. So this was kind of foreign to him, but uh, this was an everyday thing to me. And uh, I filled out the application, and sure enough, uh, he hired me. He says, now you're going to be the first African-American de detective. I want you to do a good job for me. I said, I won't let you down. I won't let you wow. down. I'll be the best. And I stayed there for a year. Now, what but private how, detective? How, but Go I ahead. want to know, how, how did it feel getting home to your wife and telling her that you actually did get this job and after you explained to her what it, what it transpired? How did that oh, really feel? She said, see, you always too ready to give up. She said, I told you, see, you just have, you just don't give up. And she was that instigator behind every move that I made. And she happened to be reading 
after I stayed at Pinkerton for a year, then they did insurance investigation, theft mm -hmm. investigation, and normally what private detectives do with long range cameras and things, bodyguard and things like that. So now uh, she was reading the Sunday newspaper again. She says, Abraham, mm -hmm. come here. She says, the Illinois State Police are hired. Said, uh, why don't you move up? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be a state policeman or not. I don't know if I can pass the test. She said, we'll take the test anyway. They say it's a six-hour test. So I went to Springfield, Illinois. Did, I did you through. say a six, a six-hour test? Six-hour test at that time. The, the advertisement, okay. the advertisement said, be prepared to stay for at least six hours. And that's what the state police examination test. And believe me, they got all six hours out of you, too. So I took the test, and lo and behold, somehow, somehow or another, I passed. I passed very wow. highly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, that's because I did a lot of study when I was with Pinkerton, see. And so here I am now, I become a state policeman. Now, as now a young you weren't the first. African American Illinois State Policeman, were you? No, I wasn't, but I was the first African American assigned to Peoria, Illinois, in the Illinois State Police. But no, there had been That's six not... other Illinois State Policemen before me. Mm -hmm. There were six now, that, before me. With that being Southern Illinois, you probably didn't have it that easy, did you? No, I didn't have it easy at all, and especially being the uh, first one in Peoria, Illinois. Which, which was which was like going, you know, way south, deep down. I think yeah. that in some instances, I was probably the first black person that some of them had seen way out in those boondock farms. You know, they would look at me because I was smoking a bear and different oh, no. things like that. And some less impressive names, but I, I realized, you know, I had my arm on. I knew where I was. I knew I was in so-called Hicksville. Little mm -hmm. places called Hannah, Illinois, and Edwards, Illinois, and stuff like that that I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, it just so happens that in uh, 1960, uh, uh, President uh, was Senator Kennedy then. He mm -hmm. was coming to Peoria, Illinois. I was the Illinois State Policeman. So they gave me a post at, uh, at, at the airport on Hannah Road to PR Airport where the president was going to come in. Now, he was a president then. He was just a candidate. So the, when the big plane landed and everything, the president crawled on the back of this long Lincoln, uh, Lincoln uh, uh, car, big convertible, white Lincoln uh, convertible. And uh, he waved. I waved. I was in uniform, and that's... The big convertible came. I stopped the traffic, and you know, I, I was sharp. I my shoes. I could look down and see my head in my shoes. I, I, mean, you I was sharp. clean. Sure. Oh, my, was I ever? I stayed up half a night brushing those shoes and really wow. looking sharp. Yeah, and uh, so he went by, and I, I really liked him. You know, he smiled and everything. I never thought I would meet him again. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. I was talking to one of the Secret Service agents, and I said, "Say, do they have uh, Negroes in, in the uh, Secret Service? Because I knew that the Secret Service protect the president. Sure. And, and, and uh, he says, uh, not that I know of, but why don't you give it a try? His name was Fred Backstrom with Special Agent in charge of Springfield. He okay. said, give it a try again, you know. Yeah, he, why he, not? Yeah, sure. Why? Right. So... Now I'm getting a little confidence. Okay, yeah, I'm going to try this thing. So I went to Springfield, Illinois, took the test. You know can, what? Can, can I butt in? Can I butt in real quick, though? Go right in. Go ahead. As as um, a police, a state policeman, how were you accepted with the other policemen on the force? Oh, so fine. Some policemen the are very, very tight. Yes, yes. They, they were uh, policemen from small surrounding towns. Some didn't like me, but they didn't make it open or anything like that. Uh, yeah. They stayed away. If they didn't like you, they stayed away from you. When we had to go to class or the range or something like that, you could tell who didn't like you, who didn't want to be bothered. The ones, the Europeans that did uh, uh, believe in equality on the job and things. They would make friends with. They would come over and introduce themselves, and you, you could tell, you know, especially okay. just like today's time. 
you go on a job, you can pretty much tell the ones who don't want to be bothered with you. Mm -hmm. So now, so I, I, I failed. I failed the test for the Secret Service. Oh, but it no. Was, it would just so happen that my, my police experience gave me enough credit to be accepted in the Secret Service under a term which is called Schedule A. A Schedule okay. A appointment. You come into the Secret Service, you do good for two years, you attend the Treasury Training School and the Secret Service Training School, and then you become a full agent. So okay. I was a, a, yeah. So I became a Secret Service agent, and it was just that it was under a different schedule. I wasn't a full-fledged mm -hmm. agent, you might say, like someone who was fully certified. Until now, I, I, had to, I can tell that you're a meticulous, studious kind of person. Can you, were you able to figure out where you fell short on the test? Oh, yes, yes. I missed it by about one or two points, yes, yes. And it, it was not on... Uh, it was not on any literary source, it was on a memory source. They showed, uh, they showed a room in a crime scene, and you had to look at it for about 10 minutes. You study it, and they asked us different questions about that crime scene. Okay. Uh, where was the knife position? How far from the body was it? And uh, what would you theorize? It's your opinion of what happened. See, a lot of times, your opinion of what happened is where the, the twist comes in. This okay. is where they can grade you up or down. Okay. You see, because there's no real answer to those type of questions. And as, a, and as a state policeman, you probably didn't cover that many um, homicides, right? No, I or didn't cover any, any, any homicides as a uh, Pinkerton National uh, detective. Mm -hmm. And as a state policeman, now you we we dealt with car accidents, you know, okay. people smashed up on the road and uh, you know just killed in automobiles and things like that. Uh, sure. Of course, when I became a, a, a state police uh, undercover agent, uh, I was in the vice division of the Illinois State Police. We dealt with prostitutes and gambling and things like that. Mm -hmm. But sure. as I said, back in those days. Uh, when you filled out an application for a job, there was always that oral interview part of it where they could either make you pass or just a wee bit under, <laughs> fall short. See, they yeah. always had those questions in there. Well, what would you do if? Now, that mm -hmm. doesn't say that what you would do is wrong. It's just saying that they have a better answer. But you don't know what okay. the better yeah. answer is. So, right, so right. they can say, well, you know, so so they grade you down on that. And that's where I came in the, under the two points on the oral interview and as compared with what they would recommend. So, okay. it, yeah, yes, and of course I understood that. I understood that. See, there were many ways that they would keep us out of certain jobs at that time. But... I came into the United States Secret Service, and Secret Service sent me to Chicago. Wow. Now, here wait, I am. Wait, I, wait, you, have to, you have to move your family, right? I had to move my family from Peoria to Chicago. Yes, I did. So we loaded up. It, it, I had a little uh, uh, a U-Haul I rented. Mm -hmm. We put everything in the U-Haul, which was about a room and a half. And my wife, she was uh, with with uh, she was pregnant at that particular time, and uh, we moved first to New York. Yes, yes, we, we okay. moved to to uh, Chicago. Okay. No, that was the second one when we moved to Chicago. That was she okay. was working on my second son, and okay. so now <laughs> here I am in Chicago in the Secret Service. Now. I'm thinking that things are going to get better. I'm, I'm with the big dogs now, you know. I would Service, think so. Silver yeah. badge, you understand, and swore, raised my right hand, Constitution of the United States. The wife is down there and everybody, yeah. you know, and oh, I'm going to run with the big dogs, you see. <laughs> okay, so now, so I join up, and I, as I pass by some of the offices, I hear him talking about that N-word. Oh, you know, no. I said, hey, really? I mean, I didn't Welcome even get this in, in, in the state police. I mean, and these wow. are feds. 
you know, didn't yeah. want to work with me and made no bones about it. I mean, they wow. would come up and say, hey, how's all Abe today and all that kind of stuff. So I had to set them straight mm -hmm. and let them, let them know, oh, Abe wasn't an oh, Abe. You know, Abe was packing mm -hmm. that 357 Magnum, <laughs> and he didn't play that stuff. You see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It didn't need this. Yeah, thing. yeah. But now here's the thing. Now, as a new agent in Chicago, the president's coming to Chicago. Now he's elected. John Kennedy mm -hmm. is the oh, okay. president. All right. And on April the 28th, he's coming to Chicago to thank Mayor Daly for the big vote turnout that Cook County got and everything. Cook County put mm -hmm. the, put the president into office by some 8,000 votes. I mean, and this was great. So he came here in order to give a victory speech so with Mayor Daly and the canvas workers and the precinct mm -hmm. commitment and all these big shot politicians and everything. So now I'm a new agent. Now the affair was given at McCormick Place. Okay. McCormick Place is a big stadium here in a, a, a big place where they give all sorts of uh, activity uh, mm -hmm. programs, car shows, and things like that. And this so was now, the first. This was the first McCormick Place. The first McCormick Place. Yeah. That's right. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about 1961, April of 1961. Okay. So now, in April of 28. So when they're giving out the Secret Service assignments in the office, they gave me an assignment which was normally given to a Chicago policeman, which was to watch a washroom in McCormick Place. What? On the, the washroom? On the lower floor, yeah, to, to keep people out of the washroom, out of the toilet, and they set that toilet off for the use of the president on it. And that's where they put me. They tried to hide me. See, the convention hall was upstairs. Oh, wow. And the lower down, down two flights of steps, they had reserved the washroom just for the president only in case he had to go. Well, that's still that very he, important. Yeah, well, it was important. So, well, so, anyway, so the if he had to go. thing was concerned. That's why I didn't. That, that's why I didn't be. But you know, they said, uh, "Yeah, well, you got the right detail. You know, you should feel right at home there." And they made all oh, sorts of little jokes, uh -huh. but they were really trying to hide me because, to be truthful with yeah. you, there was a better washroom on the first floor and a shorter distance mm -hmm. for the president to walk. You see, because we had gone huh. through and walked through, and I had seen the different locations where some of the other agents of other races and nationalities were put in close proximity to the uh, table where the president was going to be at the banquet, standing by the door that he would have to come mm -hmm. in, and all different obvious positions where you could right. look sharp and your badge is showing. And I mean, yeah, this is a big time Secret Service agent. Here yeah. I am down, down, down in the sub-basement. Yeah, I'm down in the basement, you know what I mean? They got me hid out, so they think. So around 8.30, the president was running a little late. So I hear the car door slamming, and I'm looking up the steps, and I see uh, cameras flashing, and I see sure. uh, the photographers backing over each other and slipping, almost falling down the steps trying to get a picture of this wonderful president that we had just elected, a man that I thought so much of. I, I was thinking, you know, if I could just get halfway up the step just to see yeah. this man. So I look up, and all of a sudden, at the top of the steps, the president's coming down the steps. Uh oh, how about He's that? walking down the steps, and every powerful politician in Chicago is right on his footstep. They're uh -huh. walking down, plow, 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 plow. Mayor Daly and the Congressman Dawson, all these big wheels that I had read about in the Chicago Sun Times, here they come, these mighty politicians, you know, and the President of the United States. So the president, he's coming and uh, uh, you know, this is unbelievable. He's coming. And you're him. standing there. I hope you didn't forget forget how to uh, comport yourself. I'm standing there. I was just actually modified. He is the pre and he's coming. He's he's going to walk by me. I had no idea except he was going to walk by. Maybe we're going to bump shoulders. And so mm -hmm. the president, instead of walking right by me, he stopped. I said to myself, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh -oh. what is this? 
And he looked at me in the uh, face and he says, uh, are you a secret service agent or you want a Mayor Daly's finest? They used to call Mayor Daly's police force a detective, Mayor Daly's finest. I said, I'm okay. a secret service agent, Mr. President. And one of the other agents told him my name. So this is Agent Bolton. He's stationed here in Chicago. The president shook my hand, smiled. I'm Whoa. telling you, what, what a about great that? smile. We shook hands and I said, so I'm saying to myself, you know, what, what should I do, <laughs> you know? And he looked me in the eye and he smiled, a, a beautiful smile came across his uh, lips. He said, Mr. Bolden, that's what he called me. He said, I said, have you been a Negro assigned to the White House detail in Washington, D.C.? I said, not to my knowledge, Mr. President. And he looked at me, he smiled, he said, would you like to be the first? Oh my goodness. I say, yes, sir, Mr. President. That's crazy. Says, I'll be looking forward to seeing you in Washington, D.C. soon. Wow. Listen, wow. I almost wet my shoes. I did. <laughs> I did. I did. I almost. Look, listen, it would have been better if I had gone to the washroom and let it stand outside because I really had to go. But I'm telling wow. you, it was something. Here I am. They tried to hide me out. And, and, and look at you talking yeah, with the look president. At me, look at me. And being shirt. invited to Washington, D.C. Getting invited in Washington, D.C. in my brand new $30 series and Robux suit. Yeah, <laughs> you now. understand? My wife made me buy a new suit because she said, uh, That was good, wasn't it? it? Oh, that was great. And I was standing up that shop as a tack, too. And now, what did she think about that when you got home? Oh, I'm telling you, the president waved and went back up the steps and everything, and I couldn't wait to get home. She was in the kitchen uh, here just off to my left, and uh, uh, she said, how did it go? I said, I met the president of the United States. She said, you lying, Abe. I said, I'm not <laughs> lying. I said, I shook his hand. He told me he's going to bring me to Washington, D.C. She saw you know, the quit lying, Abe. I said, look, I'm telling the truth. She, wow. It was hard for her to believe, but the minute that she believed me, she jumped on the telephone. I'm telling you, she started calling everybody that she knew. Hey, met the president. Hey, man, he's going to watch uh -huh. it. See, I said, I haven't done it yet. Well, hold up a minute, you know. But now, how you, long have you been working in Chicago at that time? Uh, about five months. This was in April. I had come to Chicago in October 1961. And uh, okay. this was April of, uh, I, I mean, this was, uh, I had come in October of 1960, and this was April of 1961. Oh, so, okay. I, yeah, yeah. So it, it was only a few months. I don't know if that makes sense. I would like Six to know months. what your, what did your co-workers think about this? Because I know how, um, how can I put this, um, unsupportive. People can be when it comes to racial things in Chicago. Yes, right. They, well, it was unbelievable when the word got around what had happened. It 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 was unbelievable. They they couldn't believe it, and it was just the talk of the office, you know. But whenever that I would come close, you know, they were they would clam up because they got yeah. they, they was talking under their breath and they were mm -hmm. yeah, yeah that ni nigger loving president they used to call president. Oh, president. And, Oh, yeah, Amen. because we, we were going through hack back then. People don't yeah. understand that in the 60s, our people were being lynched. People were being killed. People were being castrated. Uh, the, the whole world seemed like they were going crazy. I don't even think that you were alive then looking at... The no, I was born in 1955. Uh, I was born oh, in 1955. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. you could fool a yeah. lot of people. You should work those carnivals <laughs> where they try to guess your age. You could fool a lot of people. Well, but thank anyway, you. Thank you. But, but, but anyway, <clears throat> when, uh, uh, when, the, when the president, when I met him, I'd seen him on television with the Nixon debates and all of this, but he exuded around him such sincerity. Mm -hmm. That when you looked in his eyes, his eyes were soft. Like he was saying to me, I can feel your pain. And mm -hmm. I want to do something about the situation that your people are in. You could just see it in his eyes. Now, he didn't come yeah. out and say that. 
But then yeah. when I went and made that flight to Washington, D.C. on June the 6th and walked over to that the White House, becoming the first African American to be appointed to the White House detail in Washington, D.C., and went through those two big White House doors. It but let me butt in, though. Come true. But let me butt in. Okay, he told you he wanted you to come to Washington, D.C., but was that accepted by your boss as a formal request for you to go to D.C.? They didn't have DC? a choice. Yeah, they didn't have a choice. All I know, so I they didn't the think they, they didn't, it was just being friendly. They didn't want me. They they didn't want me to go. They didn't want me to go, and I understand that some of them tried to block me going, saying I had another assignment or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the president mm -hmm. had made this promise, and uh, on about uh, I must have received it two weeks uh, before June the sixth. When I became the first African American, I wow. received a memo out of Washington D.C. to report to the White House detail from the chief of the uh, United States Secret Service. So this was just not wow. a routine thing. This came directly from the president. That's amazing. And what a, a great and wonderful man uh, to be around. He was just so sincere. All wow. while I was on the White House detail, he looked out for me. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he would ask me, how are things going, Mr. Bowling? Because things were going bad. I what? saw, oh, terrible. They were terrible. There were more racists on this, in the Secret Service surrounding the president that I had encountered in a whole lifetime. Okay. I heard more negative talk about Kennedy's racial policies, his family, all type of rumors coming from Secret Service agents who were surrounding the president. There and these were, are the people who are supposed to be guarding the president. That, that's right. That's right. I mean, which which mm -hmm. I thought that was very dangerous because we had uh, Southerners who had been on the White House detail for several years sure. that, that, that were saying that if someone attempted to assassinate President Kennedy, they wouldn't react. They would let it happen. They hated him oh just that much. Oh, my God. Isn't that something? Wow. So now here, wow. we, here I am in Hyannisport, and uh, the president is getting ready to go out, out on a yacht in Marlin, and he saw me standing near the, the, the beach, near Nantucket Sound, where they have to go out and get on the, on the yacht. And he had noticed that, I was never on a yacht. The agents were assigning people around me. Other agents, two agents would be on a yacht today, maybe three tomorrow, but, but never me. Mm -hmm. And we were in Hyannisport uh, for starting about July the 2nd to July the 4th, and they were rotating around around me. So I noticed I was getting ready to go down and get on a follow-up boat, and I noticed that the president looked out of the cabin door and he called a supervisor over there. Okay. He called him over and they had a conversation. This supervisor's name was uh, Harvey Henderson. He was from Mississippi. He hated the president. He wow. walked over to me and said, there's been a change of schedule. You're on the yacht today. Mm -hmm. So the president had put me on the yacht. So here I am on the yacht sitting in this real leather chair. I mean, I'm sitting on, on, on the back of the, the aft and the fore. I don't know where I was, but all I know, it was this huge, really nice, still smell like leather chair that wow. seemed like it hugged you when you sit out. See, that's <laughs> the way Kennedy lived, you know. That's a good stuff. Uh, I really didn't have, yeah, I, I didn't have an affinity for all that finery, but as long as I was there, you know, my rear end felt good in that seat, too. But anyway, <laughs> here I am sitting there, and I'm looking out way out across the ocean, man, took it sound, and I, I'm watching the speedboats with the sirens on it, telling everybody to move back to president, so yacht is coming, and this and that. It's a lot of activity that's going around the president whenever he goes, anyway. 
and all of a sudden... And as a Secret Service agent, what, what, what are you supposed to be guarding for when you're on the yacht? Because that's a pleasure well, trip, right? That's, a, that's his pleasure trip. Everything that he was doing was on vacation. But if the president, if the yacht starts sinking or something, i got to save his life. I guess so. I'm okay. the guy yeah. who was responsible to, to take the first action. That doesn't okay. mean that it's entirely on me because there's a whole boatload of agents that are following a yacht on both sides, and some of them are way in front of the yacht. So he's well really? protected, you know. But okay. the, the two agents that are on the yacht, if the president becomes ill or need emergency attention, they, they're the ones who monitor the radio and let the other agents know what's happening. Okay. And, and that, that was my position on, on the yacht. And uh, it, it's a fine position to have, I tell you that. Uh, so no, I'm sitting here in this nice light, uh, light uh, beige uh, uh, leather chair, and the cabin door opens, and here's this uh, Navy man, all togged out in his white. Mm -hmm. And you know the Navy can get clean. Oh yeah. Kind of oh yeah. And them shoes were just sparkling. Looked like I shined them myself. <laughs> and he had this tray in his hand. And he walked over to me, and I'm seated in a chair. And I looked up, and I said, yes, sir. He said, Mr. Bowen. I said, yes, sir. He says, the president would like for you to have lunch. Oh, and he, oh my goodness. He reached down, and he pulled up uh, something. And I don't know where it came from. You know, I didn't know that. But when you get beyond a rocking chair, that was it for me. <laughs> I don't know all about this stuff coming out from under the bottom of the chair and all. But anyway, he pulled it up, and it made like like a tray. Okay. And he set, set the tray down, you know, and everything. And it had on there a, a, a pot, I think it was a Sprite, and it had this a clam chowder soup. First oh, time uh, I'd had clam chowder soup. New like England that. clam chowder. Oh, yeah, in the New England clam chowder, and they had them little crackers there, you know, and everything. Yeah. Oh, they knew you made it then. And, and real silver spoon. I looked at it, stirred and wow. silver. Yeah, stirred and silver. <laughs> Not silver plated like I've been used to. The real thing. Oh, this was a real thing, you know. I bet and you almost couldn't even believe that you were doing that. I couldn't. I bet you almost believe. could not even picture yourself. I, you, you know, I, I just couldn't picture myself. And I'm hard when it comes to finery and things like that. I never cared too much about it because I grew up poor, but I didn't mm -hmm. really know that I was poor because it was so much love in my family. My mother and okay. father. I had sisters and brothers. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, then we, back there, we had community. Everybody mm -hmm. in the community was your mother and father. So we had we had no sense of being poor materially sure. because there sure. was so much support and everything physically and emotionally and spiritually in the church. And, 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 and teachers were teachers. Principals were mm -hmm. real principals. Teachers wanted the people to learn, and they were there to teach. Not to draw right. a paycheck. Some of them would have so, thought whether they got a paycheck or not. So that yeah. was the atmosphere, you know. So what are the rest of your family thinking about your being with the president as, as a Secret Service agent? My wife, uh, my wife burned the telephone up. Uh, they <laughs> tell me she talked on the telephone from June the sixth. But let me tell you this: that was the hardest time in my life. Oh. The most racist time in my life. I got called the N-word more times, as I said, while I was on the White House detail and insulted about my race from other wow. ages, my fellow ages, more than I had at any other time in my life. And mm. I was so surprised and I was dejected. Plus wow. the real issue. See, I was there to perform a task for the United States government. Not mm -hmm. just the president, the United States government, the constitutional government formed by the founding fathers. See, mm -hmm. now that's a constitutional office that we were protecting, not the man. Sure. And to hear my fellow agents, some of them, not all of them, there were some mighty good agents there. Clint Hill was one. There were some mighty fine Secret Service agents, most of them. Were mighty fine, but you had that core 
mm-hmm. that were filled with hate that said, sometimes I would like to kill Kennedy myself. This is just how they wow. talked about it. It was so deep, and I heard them say that. Wow. And so I knew that when we came from that yacht ride, and my supervisor of the Secret Services, Harvey Henderson, we went back to the room where we were living, the little apartment where we were living, and he was sitting there. He had a can of beer. He liked to drink. Mm-hmm. He would, he would be, he he loved his beer. He would drink one beer after another while we were out of duty. And I was standing there. But I never will forget it. it was about five thirty in the afternoon, the news was on. I was standing near the TV, about to walk out the door. And uh, Harvey Henderson called me. He said, Bowden. So I looked over there. He didn't answer the first time. He called me again. He said, Bowden. So I looked around. I said, what, Harvey? Because I knew he didn't like me. Yeah. I knew yeah. it. I knew it. He had already shown that. He says, I want to tell you one thing. And don't you ever forget it. He says, you a nigger in word. You were born an N-word, you're going to die an N-word, and you will never be anything else but an N-word. Mm. So act like one. Now this act man like was one. my supervisor, yeah. He was my supervisor. And he mm-hmm. told me this. He is the one to give me my assignments and tell me where to go, how long to be there, and what to do. And wow. he is a supervisor within the ranks of a government of governmental agent that is appointed to protect the President of the United States Mm -hmm. and the Constitution of the United States. So I had to make a decision. I said, because now if I if I stay on the detail, I'm going to get hurt. You know why? Because I got to let the Chief of the United States Secret Service know about this problem Mm-hmm. Among Do you really think they would have? You think they would have uh, put a hit on you or something? Oh, most definitely. No Jeez. question about it. No question. I say, I, you see, see, once, uh, once that uh, you in an organization like that, like the Secret Service, even the Illinois State Police, they got this uh, this uh, blue line that you don't cross. They, the police talk about it. Even now, they got this, this blue line. You uh-huh. don't squeal on another cop. You don't testify on another cop. If you know something bad about him, you don't say anything about him. Or especially uh-huh. if he's your supervisor, he'll walk you into a place and you get your head blown right off your shoulder wow. because you got to do what he says. And okay. so I had to make a decision, uh, Sister Patricia, whether I wanted to just bear with this and remain on the White House detail or go straight to the chief of the United States Secret Service, reveal to him what I knew, and leave the detail, because I knew after then I couldn't stay there. Okay. So yeah. I decided to go in and talk to the chief of the Secret Service, and I went in and I told him all of these things that were happening, what they were saying about the president, about him being an end lover, about him needing his head blown off, all of these type of statements that, yeah. that they were making. And the chief told me he would take a, uh, take a look at it and he would have it investigated. I said, I would like to be transferred back to Chicago. Now, was this a fair guy? I mean, as far as you knew, was he a good guy? No, here's the thing about it. U.E. Barman, who was the chief of the Secret Service, was leaving in a month, but I didn't know that. He was retiring the next month. Oh, okay. But I didn't know that. Now the chief of the Secret Service, who was the chief of the White House detail, the people about whom I was complaining, became the chief of the United States oh, Secret oh, Service. Oh, wow. Okay. Goodbye. Yeah. I guess so. Wow. <laughs> you, you see how things work, sister? <laughs> yeah. But so don't you he, think... Well, let me ask you this. Would it have been ridiculous for you to bring this up to the president? After all, you had a personal invitation to join the crew 
at the White House. So wouldn't you think that all President Kennedy would have to do is we will not accept this kind of racist behavior and that would be it? Don't you think? I thought, I thought about that too. I said, well, as when I'm standing in front of the White House door, or uh, if I see the president going to his car or something, uh, I thought about just walking up to him and saying something when he was out there trying to play football and things like that. And I said, but you know, in any agency, you have a chain of command. And that oh, chain no. of command is thick. Nothing had happened yet. So oh. if I walk up and tell the president, the president uh, uh, was very aware. As a matter of fact, Governor Wallace, Governor Faubus, and a lot of these southern governors were mm -hmm. saying the same thing that Harvey Henderson said, that he's an end lover and yeah. things like that. He was a communist. He should be disqualified from office. And, and the same thing that they're saying about President Obama now, the same atmosphere. Yeah. They, they were just after huh. the, the president. So yeah. it was no secret that he had racial enemies, that there were people that wanted to do him harm. That was no secret. But now, if I had gone up there and made a claim to direct to the president, I know that without an investigation, I wouldn't have gotten any support whatsoever. But the chief of the Secret Service, whose job it was to investigate these type of situations, and he had a whole staff to do this, called sure. the staff of inspectors. That was his job to put undercover agents in there or do what needed to be done in order to find out whether or not I was telling the truth, whether the president was in danger. See, when I went to the chief of service, I was following the chain of command. Okay. Because the minute I got back to Chicago, I also, uh, for future reference, followed the chain of command and went to my district supervisors here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I continued to follow the chain of command and went to the inspectors in Washington, D.C., See, I, I knew that I had to do everything right or uh, off comes my head. Okay. See. So so you did um, move back to Chicago? You feel yes. defeated? Yes, I came back to Chicago. I didn't feel defeated, no, I, because I felt that I had done everything in my power that I uh, should do. Now, there was a time when uh, I did intimate to the President Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy that mm. the secret service, just being a Secret Service agent was not my goal. We had a conversation standing there. Now, that's the time that I should have brought it before the President because the U.S. Attorney was standing there yeah. at that time. Now, that, that's my thinking now. But when you're yeah. under all of that pressure and you know that all of these people that are around you are carrying weapons just like you, just like you are, and accidents do happen. Accidents. You mean do a happen. accidents? Yeah, yes, accidents <laughs> do happen. Wow. I mean, it'd yeah. be easy for me to fall off that yacht and bust my head. I'm just saying, you mm -hmm. know, once or once a conclusion yeah. start, and and to sure. show you just how serious it was, is that I continued to complain about the protection that President Kennedy was getting. I continued to mm -hmm. complain, continued to write memos, send them to Washington, D.C., just continued to harp on the fact that I didn't think that the president was, was being protected properly and by the proper people. Mm -hmm. Then comes November the 22nd. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, you think it didn't hit the fan then? See, now they're focused on me because I've been this guy who's been complaining. But, but been first, but for the, Sorry. there might be really young people watching this who might not realize that was the day that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in, in Dallas, Texas. So That's right. When that That's happened, right. you were in Chicago, and did you, when, when you got the news that he had been shot, did you say to yourself, oh, I knew it, I knew yes. it? Yes, as a matter of fact, I said it to them. I said to the Secret oh. Service agents uh, several times when the president came to Chicago on a couple of visits, you guys are going to get the president killed. Mm. You're going to get him killed because they would come here, a few of the agents would go uh, immediately go to Rush Street, they would get drunk and they have to be back on duty at 8 o'clock uh. in the morning. 
and they would stay out until three o'clock in the morning drinking, getting sloppy drunk, and watching girls tabletop dance. And I thought that was despicable conduct for people of the caliber who are surrounding the president. Right. You, you, you understand, and 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 I would complain about all of this type of conduct. Well, they didn't take me serious until the president was assassinated. And they called me a lie. They called me a lie, Sister Patricia. For 50 years, they called me a lie and said the Secret Service did not engage in such conduct. For 50 years, they called me a lie. Mm. Until just here recently, they found out that in Colombia, it was true. They went out with these different prostitutes. Right, they found right. out they did the same thing in Hannesport, Massachusetts. In mm -hmm. Minnesota, it was, as a matter of fact, they found out that there was a culture of that conduct that had been going on for several years. Several and decades. I've been decaying. You, yeah. you see what I'm saying? But I saw it all the way back there. I said, this is the conduct that's going to get President Kennedy killed. Mm -hmm. And it almost got President Obama killed. Now, wow. so right away, I see a cover-up that's going on in the Secret Service office. Once the president is assassinated, I see him destroying reports. I see him calling in agents like they call me in and say, you don't know anything about the protective procedures of the president. Don't talk to newspapers and this. All of the information has to come from the chief of the Secret Service. And there was a cover-up. There were names that I knew that mm -hmm. were involved in the assassination of the president in pre on previous occasions that were not being presented to the Warren Commission. There were whole investigations that were conducted here in Chicago mm -hmm. concerning people who had predicted that the president was going to be assassinated immediately. Now, this is in November, November the 18th. We had an yeah. informant said that the president is about to be assassinated. We knew wow. about that. Yet this, this that, is, people, that is not in the Warren report? No, no, that's not in the Warren report. No, this, this wow. man was never interviewed. See, hmm. now, scary. when I said that, and I named the pe people in Miami who were in a, 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 a telephone call, which the Secret Service recorded, uh, along with the deputy sheriff, uh, undercover agent down there, in in uh, in Miami, Florida, for fifty years they called me a lie, wow, and said nobody had threatened President Kennedy with a high-powered rifle from a tall building. Fifty years they called me a lie, sister. Man, now last year, an FBI agent, Don Adams, wrote a book. Mm -hmm. His book is called. From a tall building with a telescopic sight. He was the agent who investigated this thing in Miami, Florida that I was talking about. And now wow. he says that they covered it up, which is what I was saying back in 1964. Wow. You see what Can, I'm saying? You see how yeah. I unravel? Yeah. You see. Tell, tell uh, now, now, I'm just going to jump in. We are talking yeah, with Abraham Bolden. He wrote this book, The Echo from Dealey Plaza, the true story of the first African-American on the White House Secret Service detail and his quest for justice after the assassination of JFK. I want you to tell us of the horrible price that you had to pay. Yes, yes. Well, when I saw these, uh, this conspiracy to deny certain facts that were surrounding the Kennedy assassination and to, to limit the Warren Commission's information as to uh, what really happened in Dallas, Texas, and before Dallas, Texas, in the Chicago investigation. Mm -hmm. I said, the Warren Commission need to know about this. Okay, here I got to make a decision again. So I says, told my wife, the next time I go to Washington, D.C., the Warren Commission was investigating who assassinated the president. I'm going to the Warren Commission and let them know what I know. Wow. The information that I had that convinced me 
that the president was about to be assassinated and the mm -hmm. information that the Secret Service had. So when I went to Washington, D.C. on May the 17th, I called one of the administrators who was on the Warren Commission uh, attorney board, you might have, you Jay Lee mm -hmm. Rankin, who was the chief attorney for the Warren Commission. And the something, next morning something, on the 18th. Excuse they, me, one, one second, Mr. Bolden. Something ahead. fell in my kitchen and I have to pick it up. I'll be, keep talking. I'll All be right. right back. All right. Okay. okay. Well, you have to check those things out when anything falls like that. But anyway, I went to Washington, D.C. Now, I'm sitting in the classroom in Washington, D.C. after I had tried to make contact with J. Lee Rankin. And the, the deputy chief of the Secret Service, who was head of the personnel department, came into the classroom and told me they had an investigation that was unraveling in Washington, D.C., and they, I mean, it's back in Chicago, and they needed me back in Chicago immediately. So they put me on a plane, and uh, two agents accompanied me back to Chicago. When we got back inside Chicago, we got back to Chicago, they wouldn't let me call my wife. They wouldn't, they, they kept me. It kept me in custody for 12 hours, not letting me call anybody, and ended up charging me, bringing a federal charge of trying to solicit a bribe from two counterfeiters, one of which I had arrested twice and found counterfeiting plates in his house. These were the witnesses who were going to testify against me that I committed a federal crime. Man. See, so here I am now, unable to get to the Warren Commission, and they are now accusing me of committing a crime. And they took me to trial on. There was nothing that I could do. They had said I mean, enough. So I mean, you were you you had gotten to the height of. I mean, you've gone way beyond any black person ever gone in terms of being a secret service agent. And the predicament that you were in then, I bet that was very hard for your family to understand. It was, it was yeah. almost impossible. Of course, my wife was always, I would always tell her what was going on. She knew the sure. basic facts of how they were treating me and all the little complaints that I had and everything. And before they came to arrest me, I told her, I said, there's something wrong, I see, in the office. My supervisor was telling me, go here, go there talk to this guy, talk to that guy. And I would do it because I, I'm an agent. So now yeah. when, the, when the trial comes up, these very people that he's sending me to talk to said I'm talking to them about one thing when the chief has told me to go talk to them about something altogether different. So what he was doing is putting me in a position to yeah. where they could accuse me of meeting them, of saying certain things. Because mm -hmm. nobody was wearing a wire. Because hadn't In, somebody come to your door the day before, and it was really obvious that he was um, he was wearing himself a set up. Yeah, yes, yeah. That's, yeah. that's right. Yes, he came came to my door. He wanted me to give him a gun to kill a federal witness, and so here they were trying to uh, set me up to lock me up forever. If I wow. hadn't had him a gun, that 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 would have done it for me. I never would have gotten out. So now here, I'm in trial in federal district court. The jury's deliberate. We've been on trial for a week. The jury goes out and comes back in a couple of times and says, we can't reach a decision. We're a hung jury. And there was a sister on the jury, a sister mm -hmm. Anna B. Hightower. She was hanging up the jury. They were voting 11 to 1 for conviction. Mm -hmm. The judge stood up behind the bench and said, in my opinion, the defendant is guilty of all accounts. Oh, my life. goodness. And then what? he sent the jury back in and said, now go back in and deliberate with the new information I just gave. Now, I never the heard that before. <laughs> That's a new one on me. I don't. I don't. All right. Now, so I go into a second trial. The judge is, the, the jury is still hung up. 
Sister Anna Beatow says, no way that this guy did that. It's, it's so many holes in that case. It's, it's laughable. Yeah, it would be laughable for somebody fair this, but, you know, my whole life was on the line. Absolutely. And so I went into a second trial. And my wife and children and family were with me step to step. I just want everybody to know that because mm -hmm. that's how a man succeeds is having that other half of himself with him. Lockstep, see, not because down. one, it's easy to knock down, but when you put two together, it's, it's a band that's hard to break, and that's what stood me up to this whole thing, and that's what stood me up until about five years ago when mm -hmm. my wife died uh, mm -hmm. uh, seven years ago on December the 27th of this mm -hmm. uh, of last month. Mm -hmm. uh, then my health started to deteriorate. But sure. but you see, I'm missing that other half. I'm missing Understand. that other half. And when yeah. we go off air, if you got any recommendations, I was like, no, I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have but, three kids, right? Yes, I have three three children, three wonderful mm -hmm. children, as a matter of fact. Uh, I have a son who is a, a, a doctor. He's a mm -hmm. uh, doctor of business at uh, Florida a &M University. I have a mm -hmm. daughter. She just retired from uh, Commonwealth Edison, excellent corporation after 35 years. I have another mm -hmm. son who is a teacher in the school system here in Chicago, computer right. business. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so she did a magnificent job in holding up the whole family and me, too. So it's very valuable wow. that our people understand that success starts with elf, family. That's where mm -hmm. success starts. If you don't like have it. that F word, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to have success. That's I just all you. good. That's the problem that we have today. We're yeah. missing the F word, mm -hmm. you see. It's so we have to learn how to spell again. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? And yes, understand sir. that the woman is the most valuable, valuable assistance that we could ever have because mm -hmm. she is the manifestation of the man of God. Now, I don't want to get off into my theology and things like that, but that's what I believe. She is the manifestation uh -huh. of the man of mm -hmm. God. And all we have to do now uh -huh. is, brothers, is remember the day when we came to slavery. And how this sister, I hate to divert, but I just, you know, whenever okay. I talk, so you I gotta got put to this say. out here. You, you, mm -hmm. you, you see, because the change was on this sister, too. And she made just all of the sacrifices that we made. And sometimes we forget that. Mm -hmm. We call her so many uncomplimented uncompliment names, you understand, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that a that, yeah. that brother's going to have to instill within his, his young sons and sisters and mothers that we have to respect our women above all. Because, listen, mm -hmm. even beasts respect their own kind. Mm. Wow, that's deep. You don't see anybody disrespecting their own kind. Listen to me what I'm saying. I'm telling you the no, truth. Listen. Yes, sir. Except the so-called Negro black man. Mm -hmm. uh, a dog mm -hmm. latch on to a female dog. And once mm -hmm. they made and had them puppies, you better not try to get between them either. And he ain't nothing but a dog. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So we got yeah. a, a, a mental thing that we got. But getting back to uh, to what the, we were talking about, and I don't want to talk okay. too long. I don't want to just, just run y'all out of here. But the judge emptied the courtroom Went doing the second trial. He okay. put everybody out of the courtroom while the jury was deliberating. He said, it's getting late and I'm getting ready to go home. I'm, a, I'm going to tell the jury to bring back in the verdict in the morning. And uh, mm -hmm. so we're going to close the courtroom now. So they mm -hmm. locked me and my attorney, my wife, and everybody that came with me and all of me outside the building. And the media the too? Media, everybody went out. Everybody went okay. out except Secret Service agents, FBI agents, CIA agents, the judge, the jury, and the prosecuting attorney. Okay. Instead of closing down the courtroom when I was on my way home, and this was in August 
August the 12th of 1964, I heard a flash on the radio. The jury just found Bolden guilty. And the judge said he was mm. closing the courtroom. Wow. And we can't find the transcripts of what the judge said to the jury today. We've been looking for them for 50 years and can't find it. Not a word that was said between the judge wow. and the jury. But anyway, if it had stopped there, that would have been okay. Because I'm a pretty resilient guy. You have you know. to be. See, see when, you, when, when you throw black carbon into that fire, if you heave it up, the, 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 the hotter it gets. Mm -hmm. Then you start yes. making it make a transition. And you just think mm -hmm. you're destroying this diamond and you get it hot, this uh, carbon, and it get hot, 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 hot. Pretty soon it, it starts taking shape, tetrahedral mm -hmm. shape. And then it uh -oh. becomes a down. Come on there. Huh? It becomes a down. Wow. So that's what but they you, did to me. Very but you actually part. served time and survived. I intact. actually saved time. I actually served, served time. time. Listen, mm -hmm. I served time. And when I went there, they sent me to Springfield, Mizzou. Now, I had... Mm -hmm already foreseen a lot of these things would happen and the people have to read in the book read in the book and see how people who wanted to do me home would make a move and god would make a move and neutralize mm -hmm. what they were doing i don't care what yeah. you call god where you want to call him jehovah uh, uh shiva uh, well whatever you call him i lie yeah. well, you call him what you want to call mm -hmm. but that high power that guides mankind would make a move on my behalf. Mm. So now they decided here's the way we're going to deal with this guy. And they have to read you, it. You know what? You know what, Mr. Bolden? Go right I ahead. actually want to leave it there because I want to leave people in suspense. All right. Really yes. Because yes. I want them to actually check this book out. Now, we have it at our library in Durham, North Carolina, so I know it's all over the country. In, of course, on Amazon.com, too. Yeah, it is it called is. The Echo from Dealey Plaza. And we're talking with Abraham Bolden. That's the book yeah, right there. That's it. That's now, one thing I'd like to ask at the very end here, because we've been talking for about an hour, I have to ask you, you've been through a whole lot. Was it all worth it? Yes, it was worth it. Because, see, a person who is afraid to fight for his own liberty doesn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. I want my uh -huh. grandchildren and your grandchildren to have the freedom and liberty that I had or I should have had. And if we're not, if we fear to stand up for that, then we don't deserve it. So wow. someone has to stand up and give that life. Now, there's one thing that the Most Holy God wanted uh, me to say tonight, before you shut down. He said, get these words in, and my sheep will know what you're talking about. That people, it is time. John the Baptist is here. The dove is ready to be seated. It is time. The Lord our God told me to tell the people that, and they will understand. Wow. Sister, I appreciate it being on your show, and you giving me an opportunity to reach out to I, those who I appreciate here. you coming on the show. Sure. Again, this is the book. I, you know, I want to thank um, Wade Timms. I'm used to calling him Thames, but it's Timms. Wade Timms for telling me about you. He sent me this book, and again, it's called The Echo from Dealey Plaza, Abraham Bolden. Check out, the, I mean, this is an amazing story. I don't even think you could have made this up. If you were a Hollywood writer, I don't think you would have come up with a story this good. I really don't. <laughs> and it's not over yet. <laughs> I thought right. you're still trying to get a pardon, right? Aren't you trying yes. to get a pardon? We're still working on, um, well, we would like to have the record uh, exonerated and have it mm -hmm. wiped out uh, completely. Uh, but how, do you, that how do you go about help, doing that? Well, the we president that? has to grant that. That's a special uh, issue that could come from the president. He could give me an adverse pardon, which means that 
I'm not admitting guilt to anything, and I'm accepting mm -hmm. a pardon on the basis that I'm not guilty of the crime. He could do that. They don't often okay. do that, but it is within his power to do that. But I will okay. tell you this, that uh, if I had a chance to reach someone that could reach him, I have some information for him, too. Mm -hmm. I have some wow. information for him, too, that, that he would be take good beware to listen to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again, Mr. Yes. Thanks again, uh, Mr. Bolden, for being on the show. Thank you, and thank you, and good night. Okay, see you later. Okay, folks, that's the end of the first broadcast of T Skyrider. I'm Pat Murray, your host. Now, if you want to, again, read more of Mr. Bolden's story, it is The Echo from Dealey Plaza. The true story of the first African American on the White House Secret Service detail and his quest for justice after the assassination of JFK. So I'm Patricia Murray. Uh, my newspaper is called the Durham Skywriter. You can read it at DurhamSkywriter.com. I have a radio show called Radio Skywriter. It airs on um, WNCU here in Durham, North Carolina on Sundays, 6.30 p.m. You can uh, also listen to it on iTunes. So for that, for that, I will say goodbye for now. I'll see you next week, next Sunday on TV Skywriter.